Hey, come on. Yeah. Yeah, get excited. Uh, if you're new with us, uh, my name's David. I love being one of the pastors around here. And there's just a teaser of something that I love that we do every year. Uh, it is an opportunity where we get to demonstrate uh, the love of Jesus in a, in a tangible, meaningful way. Uh, we get to serve about 800 people from our community through this uh, event called Triple Tree. Uh, it used to be a consolidated event in one location, and in order to really be people helping people find life with Jesus one life at a time, there was a shift where we relocated the 17 sites around our community that then finishes back on this campus, and it is a meaningful way to have conversation and foster uh, a heart of what it means to be living proof of a loving God. And so uh, if you've been around here now, uh, over the summer, we wrapped up Titus, and you guys have to now suffer through three weeks of sabbatical learnings of what uh, you allowed me to do for the past three months. And last week, we, we got to sit in this idea of stillness, that Jesus is sweeter, but man, being still is hard. Uh, I experienced that. That might be something you guys navigate and are pressed with what does it mean to be still and know that he is god dave is this too close for you right here are you comfortable down there this is a little, little close this splash zone uh and, and this morning just the idea of growing and evangelizing evangelizing and discipling our kids models matter uh, i got to have uh, these three sweet months of being with my kids uh most days sweet uh <laughs> But, but it was something that just pressed what it means to invest in our kids, our grandkids, uh, and, and those maybe longing to have kids or, or uh, still trying to figure out what a relationship might mean. I hope we get to press into that today. And then next week, being intentionally invested in the lives around us uh, is a longer process, but Jesus sends us to the harvest each day matters. And so we looked at Psalm 46 last week, we'll look at Psalm 78 today, and we'll look at Psalm 90 next week. And, and so just a, a, small, a small window into, into my life, because um, I imagine when the thought or concept of talking about family comes out, uh, our minds could, could go in a variety of directions. And so it, it, was a, it was a blast this summer. So that's a shot from Father's Day in the middle uh, with our sweet dog, Franklin. Frank the Tank, we love Franklin. He's a sweet part of the family. Do you ever wrestle with how much you're willing to pay if your dog eats a sock or something like that? Has, has that ever crossed your mind? It is a frequent conversation when my kids love this dog. I'm also trying to taper expectations, because I love, but I love my dog. Maybe I shouldn't have commented on that. Anyway, on that side, first trip to the North Woods. We absolutely loved it. We'd never been to the North Woods, and we rented a cabin on a lake in, in Crandon uh, on Lake Lucerne. Uh, and... Uh, and uh, my kids, it was a 400 square foot, probably beautiful, rustic cabin. I mean, it's just like quintessential, like out of a fairy tale, right? My kids' comments, this is small, Dad. I'm like, this is why we're staying here. You're learning some value of gratitude. And so we had a great time. Absolutely loved it. And then, and then on the left, uh, you'll see a Village Creek Bible Camp uh, to end the summer. We got to go to this uh, space uh, that some friends around here, Rick Pearson, Rick and Michelle, uh, Tom and Julie have been raving about this place that, that we needed to go. And so I often would tell Rick, hey, you know, I have like this gig on Sunday that prevents me from going away for the weekend, right? We, we understand that. But finally was able to go and it was incredible. We had a wonderful time. One of the things that made it so sweet uh, in that picture, you may or may not be able to see, but there's a young lady with us. And so this camp does a phenomenal job at family camp. What, what is like one challenge? Maybe it's the challenge, but what's one challenge sometimes in going away as a family, maybe more for the mom than the dad, the one challenge is you're like, I'm, I'm not on vacation. I'm just parenting in a different location. This is just the same stuff. We're just in another place. They provide a family assistant, and, and this person goes with you, and it was about two or three hours in. One of my daughters turns to me and goes, Dad, you know you can leave now. Lily's here. I'm like, what is this? This is a family vacation. We're supposed to be enjoying time. But, but they enjoyed that so much. They're in fifth grade now. They said, hey, can you print, Dad, can you print off that picture so we can put a picture of our family, mostly Lily, in our locker this year? They had such a phenomenal time. But 
Uh, you'd be hard pressed to, uh, to look at our family and, and go, <laughs> are those your biological kids? You'd go, oh, I, I think there's a slight difference. And so uh, for Casey and I, a, a part of our journey uh, of even growing into what it means to be parents, I, I think this is a beautiful thing. I think God, uh, for some of us, has placed that strong desire for Casey when asked what she wanted to be when she grew up. Her words, a mom. And so, and so for us, when we navigated infertility, it, it became a, a challenge that was pressed on us in, in a pretty, pretty meaningful way of, is God better? And, and the Apostle Paul tells us, for some, singleness is actually the best because it, it untethers you to be solely sold out for the kingdom of God and advancing his purposes. So ultimately, as we talk about this this morning, hear my heart, it's not ultimately about kids. It's not ultimately about marriage. It is about the kingdom of God advancing in this world. And for some, as parents or as grandparents or as those or as an uncle or an aunt, the impact we get to have on those that have uh, that are coming after us. My aunt, specifically, uh, never had uh, kids, her and her husband, wonderful, and, and I would say had a profound impact on my life, the impact that you get to have regardless of your station when it comes to marriage. So just a small background into that as we jump in. Uh, when you think of outsourcing things, what comes to mind? I outsource a lot of things, right? <laughs> Mowing the lawn. I, it was the balance of, am I wanting to invest the money or go spend the 30 minutes? But we outsource a ton of stuff, mowing the lawn, cleaning the gutters. I cleaned the gutters for the first time this past summer. It was mucky. I think I'll go back to maybe outsourcing that. <laughs> Fixing things around the house. Some of you guys, some of you guys are DIY people. I am so thankful we're in relationship and connected. I, on the other hand, <laughs> is... It's not my experience. We, we outsource that pretty quickly. Clothes, car maintenance. Some of you guys like geek out about restoring cars and, man, our carburetor or whatever is a starter. I'm like, I have no car stuff. I, I don't have a first clue. I am always like sweating bullets when I go to like get my car fixed. I'm like, oh, please don't. Oh. Clothing and food. Uh, I mentioned eggs last week. Someone said, hey, you could come buy some farm fresh eggs. Some of you guys have chickens. <laughs> some, like clothing and food. Like, I, I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't born in this century. I don't have any of those skills. But <laughs> some, like, we outsource this stuff. We're not knitting. We're not churning butter. Some of us, maybe. <laughs> things we outsource. But this summer, what, one of the things that was pressed on me... One thing we, we cannot outsource is that we get to be the primary influence in our kids' lives in pointing them to life with Jesus. That, that's something we cannot outsource. Uh, I stumbled upon a, 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 an article. It was, it was framed around parenting. You don't have as long as good parents as you think. But the stats are true. I just reversed them. 75% of the time we spend with our kids in our lifetime will be spent by the age of 12. You've spent 90% of your time with your children, by and large, when they turn 18. Just the sobering reality of, of the investment that we get to have, because a lot of those are from... 6 a.m. or whenever they wake up till 8.30 p.m. or whenever you set a bedtime. A significant amount of investment and time that is taking place. And so as we read Psalm 78 together, I'm going to read it for us. It, it is entering with this mind. God is giving us a, a way in which we get to invest both as parents and as a community of faith in the lives of our kids knowing these are precious, precious times. Here's Psalm 78. Let me read it for us. Psalm 78. And we're just going to go 1 to 8. Primarily, we'll, we'll spend time in 4 to 7. 
But there is another part of the chapter that I will reference today. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. And I will utter dark sayings from old. Just historic, nothing spooky about this. Just things that matter. I will utter dark sayings from old. Things that we have heard and known. That our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. But tell of them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the lord and his might and the wonders that he has done he established a testimony in jacob and appointed a law in israel which he commanded our fathers to teach their children and the next generation might know them and the children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in god and not forget the works of god but keep his commandments and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. This morning, from the start, that this is the design of God that we would, for every single follower of Jesus, make disciples who make disciples that make disciples. That that is the call. And this summer, what's been pressed upon my heart is just a deepening view of the importance of helping our kids love Jesus, both as parents and the community we are planted in. So pray with me, and we will we'll dig into Psalm 78. Jesus, you are so good. Uh, what a precious gift these lives are that you entrusted into me as well as to others. Uh, or, if that is not our journey yet, help us trust that you are at work in our lives, ultimately, that it is about your kingdom advancing. And so reveal yourself this morning uh, as we look to hear from you through your word. Always for your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, the first one uh, that the psalmist will tell us about, understanding who God is, is the most important thing in life. Where does the psalmist start in verse 4? This is what he says. We will not hide them from our children, but we will tell the coming generation of the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Now, is that usually where we sometimes want to start? No, we want to start by saying, close the fridge, (laughs) follow the rules, do the thing. And yet, I love where the psalmist starts because it gets in my heart too. Where does he start? He says, it is ultimately, fundamentally, about knowing, hearing, experiencing the glorious deeds that the Lord of, uh, of our Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done. It is the fundamental, fundamental place the psalmist starts. It starts with God. The idea of parenting, the idea of living this life starts with God. And so our personal passion, what we love, then defines what we do. Our first value around here, joy in Jesus. That it is a conviction that our bucket is filled up with his love. That that we are first and foremost, we identify as sons and daughters of the king. That our identity is found in him. And we want to experience more of him in this life. That's where the psalmist starts. And then that bucket overflows. Kids are sponges soaking it in and watching right now, maybe even. They're watching us, and you guys probably have stories where you go, huh, maybe I I should have been a little bit more calibrated in that situation. But it starts with our bucket first being overflowing with what it means to experience his love, that we are sons and daughters of the king. And then the psalmist continues, reading, truly reading the Bible will change your life. So, so if you believe it, so we're going to watch a flow. Tell me if you see this flow as well. But I think the psalmist is brilliant. He, he just walks us through a, a logical progression of how this thing called parenting and investing in the next generation works. Verse 4, we will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and wonders that he has done. Where's the very next place he goes? He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel. What was the law? He gave them the Torah, the teachings, Genesis to Deuteronomy. What did he give them? Gave them a book. The way God chose to reveal himself. Don't miss this. 
What, what does God say? I established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel. The very first place he goes in order to speak to the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. What did he do? He said, I gave you this book. Now, there's a mystery there, right? That somehow, I believe Moses actually wrote those words, and yet God was inspiring Moses to write those words in the Torah. The rest of Psalm 78 outlines all those glorious deeds. So you can go back and read those, but I just want to fly through them really quickly. He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law. Because sometimes, here's what it feels like. Man, there's a cool Tim Keller book that tells me about the Bible. There's a cool... Francis Chan book that tells me, or Bob Goff book that tells me about the Bible. For me, there's a cool John Piper book that tells me about the Bible. And yet, our conviction around here, we want to help people hear from God through his word. And so in Psalm 78, the psalmist then just continues to outline that. He outlines in verse 10 a reference to Exodus. He outlines in verse 13 and 53 another reference to God parting the sea. He references in verse 14 uh, their journey through the wilderness. Story after story of God's glorious deeds is then outlined through the rest of the book, all pointing to God gave us the Torah. He gave us the law, a testimony in Jacob, God's provision, his judgment against sin, his mercy towards people, his signs and wonders against Egypt, the plagues. God's victory over Israel, enemies and provision in Joshua, and then God choosing David as king outlined in Samuel in verse 67 to 72. The psalmist then gives us a, an outline of that. But what's it all connected to? What God had revealed in his testimony for Jacob and the law for Israel. Understanding who God is is the most important thing in life. And then actually really reading Really reading will change your life. And so now follow this thread. See if it makes sense to you. He then goes to teaching. Is how that happens? Teaching becomes meeting others where they are. Here's what he says. We'll not hide these from our children. We'll tell of the glorious deeds. He established the testimony in Jacob and appointed a law which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. So, so what exactly is this teaching? What, what is that? What is the teaching that he's describing? Here's how it makes sense to me. One, this teaching, meeting our kids where they are in their developmental journey. Maybe you as grandparents feel this. Life goes by way too fast. I feel like those moments of teaching... Sometimes I'm just I'm lost in the accelerated nature of how quickly these moments pass. We take a, I don't know about you guys. We take a first day of school and a last day of school pick, and uh, and I'm always blown away by just how fast the time goes. I'm only forty. Oh man, what does that feel like to say? But I imagine. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, but I imagine for others. This quote is, or this idea is even more relevant for you. The time just goes way too quick. And I feel this. Raising kids, I just have my own limited perspective, is more complicated than I can imagine. Maybe for some of you others, you look back and go, some of the things your kids are dealing with as they're raising their kids, it, it just feels so convoluted at times where, where I'm just unsure of the best way to practice. And we're doing it as we go. And so it just feels to me, when I think of teaching, passing the glorious deeds of our God, it just feels more and more complex and complicated. Because what I'd like to say is just do these things, right? But that's not where the psalmist starts. I was watching the debate with, uh, with uh, I was watching the debate with my wife. Kids are in and out. And and Wisconsin, if you've noticed, we've been inundated with a lot of advertisements. And so one of my daughters comes up to me and says, Dad, I don't know who to vote for. I'm like, well, you're only 10, so you got a little time. <laughs> but, but watching both, she was saying, man, I don't know who to vote for because each commercial is telling a different side of the story. What do I do? How do I know what's right? How do I make a decision 
about what I do, what, what choices I'd make, because I hear this story and I hear this story, and they're both sharing negative things about the other. And, and so for me, it became a moment. Teaching is meeting others where they're at. That was the question that she posed to me. Uh, right or wrong, here was my answer. I said, man, isn't that interesting that, that each party is offering a different set of ideas about the other candidate? Uh, and what we see is there's no perfect person, that no one in this life is perfect. Isn't it great that we have a perfect God that we can lean on? Taking an, a moment about the fallibility of, of, of people and trying to turn it into a teaching of the glorious deeds of our God, right? Teaching is just meeting others where they are at. Now, did the conversation go much further than that? She was content with that answer. And then there is a great amount of joy in this journey of parenting. Every stage, we now have a three-year-old up to a 10-year-old. Casey and I were doing the math. How old are we going to be when Eden is graduating from high school? But man, every stage has been delightful. And, and I just assume that continues for you guys with grown kids. That, that for us, there has been a great joy. Now there's different experiences when we're dealing with a three-year-old or a newborn who can't sleep and you're thinking, will this day ever end? The phrase I heard that, that, that has stuck with me, uh, the, the days are long, but the years are short. And there is a great amount of joy in this journey of parenting. But tell me if this holds true for the flow of the psalmist. A major thing we can teach is actually teaching them to read. The glorious deeds of the Father, then where does he go? Expressed in this biblical text. And then the very next thing he goes is, so teach them. And so I I don't know how well I do at this, but man, I'm trying to be even more intentional because I used to read stuff on my Kindle or my iPad and my phone. I've tried to shift to to just even reading in a hard copy, (laughs) that there's something about this that they're observing, teach them to read that would spur on some conversations. Understanding who God is is the most important thing in life. Reading, truly reading the Bible will change your life. And teaching is meeting others where they are. The next place the psalmist goes is trusting God in the gap of my teaching and their knowing. Trusting God in this gap of my teaching and their knowing. Here's where the psalmist goes. Because there's a massive step that starts to happen here in this progression that the psalmist develops. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. Fathers and mothers commanded our fathers and mothers to teach their children that the next generation might know them. Now, how close is that gap of our teaching and their knowing? There's another proverb that says, train up a child the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Pretty strong language. What it seems to me, and we've seen this, if you read the Old Testament, not all good kings had good sons. There was no guarantee. In Hosea, God himself even says about his own kid, is there any more perfect father than God? No, here's what he says about his child, Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him and our, and out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and the burning of offerings to idols. Hosea 11. Is, is there a guarantee? Cause that's, I feel like that's what we want, right? If, if I do these steps, then this will happen. And I imagine maybe for some of you, you you even have that pain where your kid has made a different choice other than what you would hope for. What he commanded to our fathers, our role as a community of faith and parents to teach. And we trust God in the gap towards that knowing. And believing that he's not done. That though we may have someone who's 
chosen to depart from this pursuit of knowing Jesus, we still get to believe that he may call them back. That might even be your story. That there was a point in life where you said, I'm not sure about this Jesus guy, and he, in his love and graciousness, has called you back. Or, (laughs) just because you might be here, though you didn't grow up in an environment that taught the glorious deeds of God, he used other people to actually draw you to himself. No guarantee, but our heart to teach, and we trust God in this gap that they might know them. And there's two ideas, I think, that flow from knowing that he outlines for us. We trust God in the gap of my teaching and their knowing. And so we pray with desperate dependence for our kids to put their confidence in Jesus. So in that gap of knowing, if they know, there's two things that I think the psalmist says flow from that. One of them is their confidence in Jesus. Here's what he said. That the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Again, he's going to get to the other element here in a second. But in knowing, where's the thing he wants them to know? Or what's the thing he wants them to know? To put their confidence, their hope in God and not forget his works. Uh, I I was debating on where to put this illustration. Maybe in a second, I'm going to share some encouragements from the summer. But uh, but for me, this 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 rings true. Uh, My temptation, and and if you did this as parents, don't don't hear me condemning you. This is process. Maybe you challenge me and give me some encouragement. This is the desire that they would set their hope in God and not forget His works. In our parenting, Casey and I uh, established the idea. We we don't want to tell our kids. God said, don't do this. Whatever this might be. But we do want to teach them about boundaries and God's sovereignty. (laughs) And so we wouldn't say, God said, don't do this. We would say, mom or dad said, don't do this. (laughs) Because guess who's sovereign in your life right now? (laughs) Mom and dad. For a time, because I want them someday to be able to trust a sovereign God who is working all things for the good of those who trust him. So if dad can be sovereign in your life for a time, don't touch that. Don't pick that up. Don't throw that. Trusting that they will set their hope in God and not forget his works because someday They're going to translate the love of a father to a loving father. But then he says one more thing about knowing. There is one more thing about knowing. We don't just throw our hands up and go, "Ah, do whatever you want. We pray our kids' faith overflows to a life of joyful obedience. And so that they should set their hope in God and not forget his works. But what? Keep his commandments. Healthy boundaries are a positive thing as we foster this teaching. Now, we, we probably know firsthand, do your kids often love those boundaries as fully as we would hope? And yet simultaneously, though they buck against them, we are convinced God set boundaries for our good, for our health and good. And you probably know that when you said, don't touch that hot stove. (laughs) Boundaries are for our good. And so I I just want to now maybe walk through the implications for this from my vantage point. I I imagine many of you may not share all of these. My hope is it at least fosters discussion and conversation. But as best as I could understand, here are the challenges it then feels like we're facing in this desire to declare the glorious deeds through the text in a teaching way, trusting God the gap of knowing so that they will put their hope in God and follow his commands. What are the challenges as we face that role of parenting and being a community of faith invested in the next generation? The first one, we just need help in understanding who God is as the most important thing in life. I I need help. I I, I can't do this alone. I'm, I'm not intended to be a monk. 
We, we do this in the context community. A challenge is, I, I just need help discovering this. I need help working through and thinking about who God is. Another challenge, I need reminders that it's worth it. Year in and year out, sometimes when everything seems to be going wrong. I just need to be reminded it is worth it when everything just seems to be going wrong. And I, I, I'm not, it from my vantage point, appearing to be all that successful in this journey. Sleepless nights, challenging experiences, screaming bouts. What do we do? We need to be reminded that this is how God intended through this journey. I'm limited on the best way to raise our kids to treasure Jesus and, and maybe simply just become a product of what I've experienced, our present system. A challenge is I, I feel like I'm a rookie. Every, every time a new season comes on, I'm a rookie. And those that have come before me are, are multi-generational, could simply be giving me feedback on the system we've inherited. And so are we simply replicating the system that we've always known, and, and I'm just limited. And different factors then provide different challenges. And so I, I just feel limited at times. Our limited willingness to consider there might be a better approach than what we have done or are doing when sharing biblical truth in essential, transferable, age-appropriate ways. Uh, I heard someone say, and it, and it rung true for me, uh, there was a generation that was asking the question, what is true? The next generation was asking, what is, what is beautiful? <laughs> and it feels like a question for our generation is, what is real? And so different generations have attempted to navigate this thing. And depending on our cultural context, and I think you guys would feel this as well, we are living in maybe a more post-Christian, more secular context, how, how do we navigate this? And so are, are there better ways, and how do we go about fostering that? And these are rooted in, again, sabbatical learning. So hear that, right? Here it is. You guys allowed me to, to shift my mind towards different things. And one of the sabbatical things that I went to was visiting eight other churches to ask this question. This was one of the questions that I just asked was, what are other churches doing around the country as we try to invest in this next generation in an increasingly pluralistic society? No relief from the strain of parenting. My wife knows this pretty well and will remind me often, you get to go to work and talk to grown-ups, right? I mean, it's just like, like there, there feels, for you stay-at-home moms, there, there's sometimes no relief. You, you're just in it. All the time, I remember when Casey and I were going through the adoption process, the foster to adopt process, we, we never had a date night for about three years. It, it, was, it was a long period of time, maybe four, where we, we just, on some level, didn't feel the relief from the strain of parenting. You're always on. How, how, how do I overcome that challenge? Another one. Challenge in building a community to reinforce the hope, the joy, the truth, and the boundaries for the best life. God offers the best life, and yet sometimes it feels like other people in our space might not be advocating for those same boundaries as we would believe are valuable from the biblical text. And we believe God in, ordained for our good. H how do I find others that, that are navigating with me, modeling with me the, the joy in Jesus. And maybe one more. Where to go to navigate tough problems? This is probably in there earlier. Uh, struck me again. Where to go to navigate tough problems raised by kids? Maybe if you have an explosive kid and, and, and you just feel like there's, there's no conceivable answer. Ought I pursue uh, some medical opportunities? Ought I pursue counseling? Are, are there other disciplinary things that I should implement? Where do I go to navigate tough problems when my kids are asking deeper questions that I feel sometimes overwhelmed? How, how do I navigate these things? Here is our best attempt to, to pursue an answer to those challenges. Around here, I, I love our, our family ministry. I love our kids and student ministries. Kids, it's predicated on this value for us. 
The way kids begin their journey with God has an extraordinary impact on the lifetime experience with him. And value to God has especially and uniquely positioned parents to be the greatest influence in the spiritual lives of their kids. And so with those two values in play, we, we put everything through that grid of engaging and leading kids around here and equipping and empowering parents along their journey to find an ever-increasing, joyful, lifetime journey with Jesus. That, that's the heart. How do we help parents, you all, grandparents, invest in the next generation? And so there are four things we do around here. Hopefully an awesome Sunday experience. There is happening right now. A corporate large group events that we do. We just experienced the family night where it's intended to be a more collective corporate experience as well as some support tools. We have a wonderfully made ministry that just is bubbling up uh, that there's a parent night coming out. For those with kids with special needs, how do we provide an environment where you just get a reprieve? And sometimes maybe in the midst of the distractions, we put together some sensory packs that will be available, I think, in the coming weeks just to provide some sense of recognition and support. This thing is tough. And and there's no necessarily like easy cookie cut answer. A third thing, parent experiences at home. How do we deploy you with, with tools in your tool belt as parents? And so we try and send a devotional out every Christmas and Easter to capitalize on really significant things in our church calendar that you as parents would feel more equipped as well as Training of parents and leaders, Aaron, I think, does a great job. Tyler does a great job of trying to provide those resources weekly or monthly, I believe. Um, But here's the ultimate key. (laughs) What do I do, David? Here was the big takeaway for me over the summer. (laughs) Just authentically modeling lives of treasuring Jesus. Models matter. Is my life reflecting one that I'm the happiest person my kids know? And so I want to ask three questions around discipleship around here. This should look familiar if you're new around here. This is what we consider kind of our view of what Jesus means when he says make disciples. Follow Jesus, build community, seek seek transformation, relationship. Relationship with Jesus, relationship with other believers, relationship with those yet to believe. Three questions. One. Do your kids see you pursue your personal joy in Jesus in life and in your marriage? Do do they see a a joyful relationship lived out? How might they see a visible, vertical relationship with God? It's because it gets expressed in the primary human relationship, namely our spouse. Are you actively and consistently cultivating relationships with others who treasure Jesus? Are you building community with others so that your kids go, wow, I can see what matters to mom and dad. They want to hang with others that are discussing these spiritual things. And the third one that may feel challenging, I love that I got to see my parents model this. And I love that though my dad retired, he continues to long to leverage his life for the sake of the gospel. Do you engage with those yet to believe in meaningful dialogue and relationship? Do your kids see those interactions? Are you a part of a holy huddle and they never actually see you interact with the world? Now, when you go to work, you inevitably do. And if you're wondering, David, I don't know any non-Christians. Let's talk. I am confident there are people in your life. Do your kids actually see meaningful dialogue? Are you inviting people into your home? Where your kids can know they, don't know they don't share what we believe, but I'm watching mom and dad show this love. Are they fully processing that? I would argue no, but are they feeling that? I would say yes. And so I want to offer some encouragement. A couple thoughts on things that I'm still growing in. <laughs> Hear these as maybe David knows these because he's not doing very well at them. Maybe that would be how you'd, how you'd frame these. This is a journey, and there is joy in the journey. Man, every day, the adventure continues. You're like, David, that's why you see the glass like overflowing full. Half full is like an understatement for the way you see life. David, I see the world as half. <laughs> anyway, it's a journey. There is an adventure to be had. So have fun, play, enjoy them. I I can't tell you how many times over this summer my kids said, Dad, can we play? Can we play? At the water table, 
with bluey characters. Can we, can we play? And some days I, I think I did better at that than others. Meet kids where they are, celebrating the effort. Man, I catch myself on this all the time. Hey, great job with blank. The goal, the shot block, the defense, whatever it might be. Trying to shift my mentality to celebrate the effort to create resilient, self-reliant kids that are, are working through things. Not simply feeling shamed if they don't get the goal. Meeting them where they're at and celebrating effort. And when you say something, it must matter, especially in setting appropriate boundaries. Back to God's sovereignty. How would I teach them about God's sovereignty if I did not, in fact, make my words matter? If my words have no meaning, then often when I say positive things, they also would have less meaning. So when we say, put that down, we don't say, when I count to three, put it down. Hey, you're going to get another chance. Put, put it down now. Okay, I know you didn't put it down, and, but now, now I really mean it. How do you know I mean it? Because my volume just gets louder and louder and louder. Our words have to mean something. They have to mean something. So that when we say, I love you, it means something. And so, especially when setting boundaries, we spark curiosity and encourage questions. We're not just dumping kids with knowledge. We are fostering a conversation, fostering conversations with our kids rather than talking at them. Now, here's the challenge. I sure would love sometimes to say a lot more than I do. And yet, we just had a wonderful conversation in my family about communion recently. It lasted a few sentences, but that was as far as they wanted to go with it. Fostering conversations rather than talking at them. Not answering questions they aren't asking. And then, making the goal discovery rather than directives. Now, you heard me say earlier, boundaries matter. So don't chuck that out just in that comment trying to have a heart of discovery. And sometimes that means I wade through endless ad nauseum conversations about Minecraft that I care nothing about. I should, if you love Minecraft, I care a little bit about it. But discovery. And then relax and trust God. I want to invite the worship team up. And I want to invite you to stand. As we pray this together. So join me in reading Psalm 145. As a reflection of this growing heart of parenting. Both to our kids. Our grandkids. And the next generation. I'll extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy.